a real behind the scenes look at two of the largest movie events in history. Uh, we've got some contest information for you and winners. It is time for, you know what? Pensado's Place. What's up, everybody? Good to have you. Good to have you. A uh, couple of quick shout outs. Um, uh, Andy down in Australia. Go for it, my friend. Perth, cool little show. Bill Kamek, uh, you made my month, my year. Uh, that email I got from you, uh, I, I haven't shown it to Herb yet, but I'm sure he'll agree. That one email made all this worthwhile. Uh, Herb and Will sacrificed quite a bit to do this show, and it's, 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 it's moments like that that make it all worthwhile. What's well, up, my friend? Well, now I want to know what he, what he said. He sent me some cool stuff, too. So, but. We'll probably, I think he CC'd you. All right. Um, and to your point, interestingly enough, this was a week full of a lot of comments from, from yeah. you guys, and, and it, it does mean a lot. Um, it does. Uh, on a number of levels, where we want to go, where we're going to go, and what, what it means to you. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm good. How about you? Actually, great. It's, it's, uh, I'm a little tired today, so uh, I hope I can keep up with Simon. Simon's a beast. Uh, I mean, yep, yep. technical well, beast, you probably creative, won't, everything. But it'll make for well, a good Why show. should I start now? Absolutely. Why should we change it since <laughs> it's already working? Well, since we got such a great guest, why don't we get some of the, some of the stuff out of the way? Is that a good idea? Yeah. Go All on. right. So, um, as usual, you know where to contact us at uh, all of our, there's our page is sitting up there, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Where, where, where is our page? I don't see it. I know. That's because it's a long story, guys. We'll, we'll explain later. Um, as usual, we want to give a shout out to our Vintage King family. Hey, guys. And as a matter of fact, we had a great call this morning with... Uh, family is the operative word there. I, I felt... I felt like we had the same DNA somehow with those guys. And it was such a cool transcontinental yeah. cause, Paris and San Francisco yeah. and us and Santa yeah. Clarita. And so big shout outs to... Uh, <laughs> Poor Will never got a word in. We didn't even get to say goodbye to well, Will. Well, <laughs> he's up against you and I. It's just <laughs> that's impossible. Uh, so shout outs to our man Chevy over there, the brothers Absolutely. Andrew and Michael, Tom and Jason who are on the phone, so um, good yeah. stuff, good, good stuff, stuff, stuff in the works. Um, also, in our chat room, as usual, is Jeffrey Ehrenberg. I'm sure that uh, there's his page, it popped up. We like right, Jeff. Look, Jeffrey, uh, ask Jeffrey to, to explain the difference in sonic quality between European 240 voltage and American 110 voltage. And there's uh, as the... As Simon pointed out earlier today, it's, it's a significant difference, so make him explain that to you. And there's the VK challenge of the week. <laughs> <laughs> a new segment we didn't know we were doing. Uh, but Jeffrey's in there. I'm sure he'll knock that out. And as well, uh, the great contest of which we've had tremendous response to um, for this wonderful piece of gear here, Pro Tools 10, there it is. Um, thanks to our avid family. Now you know how to enter. So you go to pensadosplace.tv forward slash avid. There you see it right below me. Uh, make sure you enter. And the more you enter, the more it op it, your opportunities to win happen. There's been a tremendous response and we're talking about some interesting things going forward with our avid guys. So make sure you do that. Because when you do that, what happens, Dave? Huh? Right. So when you do that, what happens is there is a winner. And uh, we need a drum roll for today's winner. Drew, you're the one who has the most rhythm. No, cool. Hold on, hold on. Oh, wait, wait, Drew, stop the uh, intro. My acting class that you paid for, yes. uh, you know, the, the, this weekend paid for. The improv. I, I was acting. I wanted, I wanted, oh, I was like, it was so good. I know. I didn't know. No, no, I, I could tell. You're amazing. I, I can tell when I see the reruns. I can't see myself right now. But so, that's pretty good acting. how about we announce the winner? Let's do it. Drew, one more time. My fingers hurt. All right. <laughs> so you heard the that, drum roll. That's your pointy finger. Your, point, your pointy finger is okay, though, right? I can't wear out the pointing finger. You know. So, anyways, the winner of this wonderful $699 bundle this week is from Portugal. And it is really? Mauricio Sousa Clay. Hey. Congratulations, wow. Mauricio. And, you know, hand claps for that pronunciation of his name. That's, That's pretty good for a Canadian. But you're a pro. Well, I'm a, you know, this is a black Canadian. Not that many of them. So, anyways. So, congratulations to Mauricio. Make sure you get into the contest. Fill it up. We're going to get you, uh, we're going to get a bunch of winners. That's um, I think... I think that's most of the good stuff. We got such a good guest. You know, we're yeah. going to have some corner office stuff in a minute, but uh, why don't we get to you and get to uh, 
Oh, you're going to hold that and oh, it's going to make I you like feel it. better. I yeah. like it. The Vanna White thing. Cool. Any, uh, there's no knobs, but virtual knobs. Easy on the on the knob stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't beat that horse. The that. FCC <laughs> called us for 2012. <laughs> and on with the show. Uh, oh, man. Um, when's nap time? It apparently is happening <laughs> now. <laughs> I was just checking to make sure. Right. Um, our guest today is Simon Franklin. Simon, uh, pick an area of what we know and love in this music business, and Simon has He's mastered it and probably it. has like eight trillion hits. And at one point in the 90s, uh, Simon had um, a fourth of all the top number one songs Amazing. for five years. Amazing. I mean, we're going to go into some of his accomplishments, but um, I was, Simon and I were talking earlier, and I'm getting this question a lot. What should I do? Should I, should I, I live in, in Brisbane, should I move to Sydney and go to school in Sydney? And I started thinking, Herb, and, 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 and Simon, it's informal here, just, just chime in, we'll get to the yeah. interview proper, but I started thinking about this, Herb, and I, 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 I'm not sure that the process of making decisions is as complicated as people think. I think you just make decisions, some are wrong, some are right, and that's all you can do. If you believe in a deity like I do, hopefully there's some guidance there, but um, it's, it's a lot like the way Tiger Woods plays golf. He's not the world's um, greatest golfer, tee to green, but he's the world's best golfer at getting out of trouble. You know what I'm saying? Well, and, sometimes you just and, and getting into trouble. Sometimes too, you just make a decision, yeah. and it's the wrong decision. You, you you make a left turn, turns out to be the right decision. It's just do something, make a decision. Don't don't it's, don't sit home with your parents. Commit. Make a decision. If if you're playing poker, you you, you your winnings are going to be commensurate with what you bet. And mm -hmm. in, in, in the music industry, if you don't bet at all, if you don't go all in with no safety net, you're probably not going to be as successful as you can. Simon and I were talking earlier. Um, if 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 you say um, I'm going to give this until I'm 28 and then I'm going to quit, well, that's okay. And 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 I'm not making fun of you, and I'm not saying you should do that. But don't expect to be a top guy. This this is this can be a secondary profession, it can be a hobby, and, and of course we love that element of this also because this is my career, but it's also my hobby too when I'm off work. So I, I, think, I think some of you guys are stressing over a lot of these decisions in a way that's counterproductive. It, it, you, you ask Herb and I all these opinions, and, and I, I tend to have the same answer. Go for it, and, and then if you hesitate, then maybe, maybe it's not the right career path for you, which is okay. You can you can you can have a lot of fun with this, and make it a hobby. And I use hobby in in the, in the highest sense of the word. So that's been on my mind a little bit. But getting back to, um, do you got anything you want to add to that? Because you, you can articulate no, I, that a lot better than me. No, I think you did fine. The, the bottom line is it's called life, and you have to live life. Mm -hmm. um, What's different between when the time when we all came up and now is people have access to lots more information, so they try to they try to find the path. Mm -hmm. The path for us was to take the shot mm -hmm. and then try to be as good as you can, learn as much as you can, and put yourself in circumstances to win. You have to do both, um, mm -hmm. and if you you can try to get as much information as you can, but if you don't take the shot, you, you're not gonna you, you can't you can't hit a basket by being on the what bench. Was, what was a, what was a bad decision you made relative to your career? A ton of them. I mean, I've, and I made a ton of good ones. And sometimes I learned how to make good ones from making bad decisions. The, the best good decision I made is to be active and to participate and, yeah. and to learn. And once you learn, mm -hmm. you, you know, I tell people all the time, particularly as an entrepreneur, you, and I won't get off on this too much, but the reality of it is, is every time you fail, you get better mm -hmm. because you now know what not to do. And so you start to focus on Absolutely. what you do do. Your successes are the things that uh, everyone remembers, but the failures are the ones that you remember. That's right. You know, you sit down and you, you sit at night and say, what the heck did I do wrong there? Precisely. And that's what makes you better, makes you stronger. Pre precisely. Right? I, I couldn't was, agree what more. What was one of your big failures? I'll tell you mine. I, I, in, in 88, I'm, 89, I moved to London. I was going to just make my career in London. It was a dumbass decision. And, and, and to keep that going, first of all, welcome. 
Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Great to be here. Uh, just really a classic, a, a giant in the bit. But, but I, you know, I'm gonna keep the dialogue going. Credits in a minute, but I was just, no, I think a, it's important dialogue. This, I, I, this be, has been on my mind, like I told you earlier today. It's just been. Let me tell you why I think it's important, really quickly. Lots of times we look at our comments, and our audience is made up of a very broad swath of people. There are people who just want technical information, there's other people that understand the value is getting the technical information, mm -hmm. and then understanding some of the stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And we, I get a ton of requests for this kind of stuff. So when you hear. I think it's, you're absolutely, you know, the thing is that, you know, I'm 48 years old now, mm -hmm. and there's that point when, you know, parents come to you and you say, my son, my daughter wants to do this. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they say, you say, well, it's a really tough business, you know. Mm -hmm. There's all that statistic about the number of bands that actually make a profit mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. But in terms of what we do in the studio, it's hard work. And I, and I usually say the same thing, which is if it's the only thing they think about, to the exclusion of everything else, then they've got a chance. Then they, then they really, you know, and that's not to say that there aren't going to be people who come through for who that isn't true, but it, it is usually a pretty good indicator of the ones yes. who, because it's tough life. That's it's right. really a hard life. I remember the first two years I was on 25 pounds a week. So that's about 40 bucks. Exactly. And you're doing a, I remember doing, there was five months for Trevor Horn where I did I was doing a 19-hour day, every day, seven days a week. Absolutely. And you get so tired, you don't even know but which it was. Fun. It was, yeah. I wouldn't have changed anything. Mm -hmm. But there are, you know, there are the early times are tough, and I think for the people who sit there and watch um, the Idol and the X Factor and think that the, the success has to happen instantly. Wrong message. Yeah. Wrong you message. know, we we were lucky. We sort of grew up when in a time when there were people, you know, whether you did get the apprenticeship, where you did learn under people that were great. You know, that, that I was lucky I got some, some fairly um, decent success early, but I remember that one of the big things for me was I did a couple of years where I did commercials. Mm -hmm. And... This was a producer or an engineer? And a producer, which did programming and arranging and writing. Mm -hmm. um, and what was great about that was that, I mean, I was still producing records at the same time, but I started doing some ads. They didn't care which kick drum I used, mm. Mm. <laughs> what hi hat, but they cared how quick I got. I got very quick in terms of programming because the speed was everything, mm. and also understanding what the main message was, which is the other thing that I think sometimes we get so high, we get so tied up in the sound of the hi hat, the sound of the triangle, yep. Yep. everything else. Sometimes we lose the sight. What makes Dave such a great mixer right. is that he gets the the main message comes across. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the track, and I listen to your mixes, and you've sat there and you find out what's important in that track, mm -hmm. and you throw things away. The best mixes are ruthless; they mm -hmm. really do. Uh, and sometimes I think the young guys and girls, when they're programming and, and, and arranging or doing any producing, remember what the important stuff is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, in terms of developing a career coming forward, it's it really sort of you know you've got to think to yourself. Yeah, would I really, you know, is this the only thing I think about? Mm -hmm. I think that's a starting point. A story, a story that you told me, um, um, Simon wrote to the BBC when he was 13 and mm -hmm. asked how to get into the film and TV business. Mm -hmm. Well, it was actually to be a record producer. Mm -hmm. To be a record yeah. producer, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool, huh? But, I, but it, it goes to something that we talk about all the time, which is that outlier concept, where yeah. it's just in your DNA and you put in time. I, uh, last week, at a, you know, mm -hmm. it's actually Don Cornelius' memorial. Um, I started out when I finally got to be a record executive, which, you know, I yeah. scratched, scratched and crawled to do that. I started out about the same time at the same place with L.A. Reid. Mm. And we were talking at the memorial, and we were talking about our sort of shared background. And he's where he is because of all the work you talked about he did in the early mm. days. I remember when he was just a drummer, and nobody would thought about him as a producer. And then he got the chairman of the company we were with said, you have to do this or I won't put out your record. They were forced to produce Ian Babyface because they had yeah. no choice. So then they learned that. And L.A. was great at mixing. Kenny was great at writing. And then his eye for talent and where he wanted to go and, and all the risks, the risk going to, to Atlanta. Atlanta was not a music scene when no. they went there. I was there. So all those risks have now, so people think it's glamorous and I just got there. No, you put in your 10,000 hours plus and you do it because you love it mm. first. And then once you do that, then all the technical stuff and all the other kinds of things, you've, to your point, great mm. point, you kind of learn what not to do. Mm. 
it's not just what all you can do, it's what you shouldn't do. I always remember very clearly that the thing I know about the great session players, and I've been lucky to work with some great musicians over the years, is the silence. It's where they don't play that's Absolutely. sometimes the most important thing. No so question. Good. Great point. Yeah. Absolutely right. This would be a good time. Uh, we, we mentioned that, 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 that Simon had uh, uh, a five-year run where he had a fourth of all the number ones. Of the top 20 albums of all time, he's got a big percentage of those, too. We were trying to figure out how many, but it's significant. Uh, currently, he's working on Spider-Man. We'll talk a little bit about that. He's doing the score for that. Well, uh, James Horner. James Horner is the. the James uh, Horner. I'm, I'm going to be doing the. Yeah, well, you worked with him too on yeah. uh, on Titanic. My yeah. heart will go on. He produced that, one Amazing. of the biggest records ever. Uh, he did uh, uh, produce the Bodyguard soundtrack, which uh, is uh, talk about. Uh, no, I'm in the program of a record on that. I oh, okay. do apologize. But you got to play. You got to meet yeah. Whitney. That was yeah, good. Absolutely. And then. Um, uh, uh, I see you, Avatar. He and I did the theme song. I mixed that. He he, he wrote that for uh, the new Avatar movie, the Leona Lewis song. That's that was kind of our our first thing working together, really. Yeah, we know each other for years. We just yeah. Been sent to... um, Tony Braxton, Unbreak My Heart, which was with LA. Right. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, Michael Jackson. Um, I did the history album, did a lot of stuff on that. Mm. And then you did uh, Jude Joint with Quincy, right? Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, Eric Clapton. Um, uh, God, I'm forgetting so many. Most things. of the Celine stuff. I mean, I, I think probably the, you know, I, the, the, in the what they call the Foster years, I was, you know, I started working with him when I first came to America, and so we had a big run of success. But Ooh. then there were things like with with Kenny, there was um, uh, Change the World with, yeah. with Clapton, yeah. and um, uh, then there were things like um, I'm trying to think, you know. I tended to have two different diversion careers, one which was the film music side of things, mm -hmm. where I was the guy that used to come for the strange textures and the unusual stuff. Mm -hmm. So that would be things like Howard Shore, I did uh, Seven and Crash and a lot of those sort of uh, films, which are all the sort of really dark, nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. and I remember with Seven, I was, uh, we had David Fincher pushing us and wanting us to do more stuff, so we take the orchestra, put the orchestra through a fuzz box. <laughs> you know. Love it. Which is, uh, and you'll hear, on, for instance, on Seven, I would take, uh, my programming instrument at the time was a Synclavier, which yeah. was this big music wow. computer. Yeah. I'd take um, brake squeals and get break all the, sam squeal? the squealing brake sound, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. Sample those, a load of those, put them across the keyboard, uh, and then play in the violin parts. And so that when you hear the violins, they're just, there's something just not just unnerving, a bit edgy, <laughs> and a bit strange. And so you'll hear, and it just made the whole thing feel a bit, Love bit it. off. Love it. On the other hand, I was doing all this AC stuff, you know, the, the, uh, with uh, people like David and so on. So there was the Celines and the Whitney's and the Tony Braxton's what and so on. What a contrast. It amazing. was, it was, uh, and they sort of eventually joined up in Titanic. Sure. But, but the, uh, right. um, I'm a, I'm, uh, you told me a story about you were working on uh what was the song i have nothing with whitney yeah and you you forgot to record the hi-hat track we it, programmed it, it up it sounded great you know the, the way they worked with david and i it tended to be the david obviously astounding musician mm -hmm. you know a great great producer mm -hmm. david would tend to play um a, a piano line down then i would do the program in the rhythm and so on then we'd put the rest the other bits and pieces together as we went along uh, and this track, we'd, we'd been working on the Bodyguard soundtrack, and there was a few songs on there, and we get it, uh, we finish it off, we to go to the mix, and where's the hi-hat? Uh, well, we forgot to lay the hi-hat down. And we're listening to the mix, and everyone's going, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that the hi-hat's not there, it just sounded great. Mm -hmm. So that is a track that, you know, it does sometimes, yep. you know, if, the, if it's Whitney, it doesn't matter. Happy accident. If, if, if this is a tasteless joke, just bitch slap me, okay? <laughs> Did you forget the hi-hat before you got your hearing aids or after you got your <laughs> hearing aids? No, I got them, like, unfortunately, I got these uh, about five, five or six years ago. I have a hereditary hearing thing, which is where my middle ear fills with right. calcium. No joke. And wow. it's, it's called osisclerosis. And I can still hear high frequencies pretty well, but I need insane amounts of volume. I need 60 dBs on the rest of the world. Wow. So what I found is that there are some exceptionally good hearing aids out there, which blast things into my ears at very, very high volume. 
you know, I've done tests. I can hear, I think, about 13 or 14K in my left ear, and it's about, a, about 10K on my right. But it has to be insanely loud. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, one thing that hearing aids did for me, though, is uh, A, I started delegating. I have, you know, engineers and people that work for me that keep me going, you know, th through yeah. it. But it made me focus on what was important. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, a good point. you know, you start realizing that actually probably in some ways made me a better producer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's interesting when you come across time, because I spent a long time denying that I had any problems. Mm -hmm. was, uh, but you don't have a problem. You just no. Have, you just have hearing aids. You probably hear better than most people. I, I, I hear different. Uh -huh. But it's, um, you know, hearing aids aren't the same as thing. But what it does do is, it, it, for me, you know, I look at the work that I've done since I got them, and I'm very pleased with it. You know, I think we, you know, oh, yeah. the stuff, you know, I, I'm very proud of the work that I did on sure. things like Avatar and whatever else. Oh, and, and the, um, you know, so it's not really changed my life, but I would say to, to people out there that uh, those people, you're sitting there worrying about something, you're, you're, the top end disappears and everything else. It, it's, uh, you know, it's like wearing glasses. Yeah. You know, when your hearing goes, don't worry about it. You know, just start dealing with it rather than not. And I know that that's uh, it's a strange yeah, thing to, that's to talk a, about. That's a, that's a wonderful thing you just said. A absolutely. And on top of the fact that just as first time meeting you, I've always yeah. been a fan, that people can get over things that are challenges yeah. and still find a way. And you should be inspired to keep going. That's the whole point you're making earlier, mm -hmm. that you have to engage, keep going, climb your hurdles, and, and go from there. Absolutely. That's amazing, man. And I, I've overcome yourself. many challenges, like being uh, unmusical and stupid. But it's sort of like... <laughs> it's, 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 he's classically trained. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, the, but you, you... It's important, you know. I think that people sometimes, you know, that... I think we've seen that there are guys out there who just, you know, I remember talking to, when I started talking to people and saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm wearing these. And my wife suggested to me, and she's probably right, that I should wear the bright orange stuff. <laughs> people would say to me, you know what, I, hate, I didn't want to tell anybody, but I'm, you know, that, and that's, that's just life, you know. Yeah. And, and as, at, I don't hear the same way that I heard when I was 24. Right. You know, right. and so um, it's fine. Um, uh, another another neat story. Um, our old buddy Umberto is mm. the reason he's here. Oh no, Joe. Yeah. yeah, Hum persuaded me to. I was producing in England, and uh, Sinclavia phoned me up and said, "There's this American engineer producer. He's working on an album." I said, "Well, I don't, you know, by then I was I was 26. So I thought I knew the, everything. Sure, sure. You know, I was producing on my own. I was doing many alternative acts in Britain and." Uh, and they, but they said, well, he's, he's great, you know, he's done Michael Jackson, he's done this and the other. And I said, oh, okay. So I went off to this residential, beautiful residential studio called the Manor and met Humberto for the first time. Um, and we hit it off, it was, it was great, you know, the amazing engineer. Yeah, and um, we, uh, I started programming for him and we were doing the, this album he was producing. He said, you work in a different way to anybody in America. You should come out to L.A. And I thought about it, and about uh, two or three months ago, that says about the, you're saying about taking the risk. You didn't call him or nothing, you just got on a plane and came out like... You, I shipped all my gear to... out, and uh, I just phoned him from, I said, I'm, I'm here. He went, you're here? <laughs> I did my first session that night. Was that part of the Foss? Is that part of the Foss? I didn't meet Foss David for six months. I've been... Say that last sentence again. You got off the plane um, and did your first session that night. Yeah. I, I did two, actually. Sorry, yeah. I was upstairs <laughs> with, with Hum, uh -huh. and then uh, this was at the old Lion Share Studios. Sure. Uh, sure. Upstairs Definitely. studio, and then as I'm walking down the stairs, I hear another, Simon, and I go, this is drum, drummer John Robinson, JR. Sure. JR says, thank God you're here. We've got this problem, and they had a synclavier down there, and, and so I did a second session. I thought, I'm in heaven. Didn't work for six months after that, of course. <laughs> um, Saved my money. But... Uh, then Humberto introduced me to David, mm. and this is you know this is the quality of Just the guy. Just in case people yeah. lose, David we're Foster. About David Foster. Yeah, sorry. Break. Excuse me. Yeah, David Foster, mm -hmm. and David and I, I think hit it off in a way that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I tend to think of myself as I play studio. I don't just play you know, keyboards, mm -hmm. but it was uh, I have a, I've, I don't, I understand computers. I've always had a no problem with working with those sort of things, and so. It was, here was this insanely musical chap, and he and I sort of worked on, I think I 
had a slightly more punk sensibility than David did. I tend to. doing punk records in England at the Well, I was, no, I grew up as a middle class punk. I sort of tried to hang out with the cool guys, but wasn't quite cool enough myself. And so um, the. Uh, but I was doing many alternative things in England, and we, we always thought we were cooler and more interesting than the Americans. Mm -hmm. well, and, in the 80s, you were. And so we'd been, you know, I came out. And we just, we had a very good way of working, you know. I would tend to do the grooves and the rhythms and stuff like that. And David obviously would play the be those beautiful piano parts on top and get the arrangements going. And, um, and we just had, it started to work. You know, he was, at that time, there was a lull in his career, and I started working with him in that lull. Mm. And then we, we sort of just, it, things built up. And Is that when you did Unbreak My Heart with Tony? Yeah, I mean, that case, that was a case where L.A. had shipped all his gear out to, and he'd say, oh, I'm going to come and help do some of the programming. And he came and heard, and he said, this is fine. My work here is done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know what that says? That I, was, I was very, um, I thought the guy showed a lot of, mm -hmm. it shows what class, you know, he's, he was happy with what I, mm -hmm. we'd done in terms of what I'd done in the groove, and, and that was fine. And, and it, uh, some people sometimes sit there stamping things over right. because they have to. You know, the guy's cool. Yeah. On Titanic, you once told me that, that you used two tons of gear. Yeah. How, how much gear did you use on Avatar? One Mac Pro. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Ties and chairs. Two tons of gear on Titanic and one Mac Pro on Avatar. In 12 years, it moved from rack. There was... Um, 14 feet of synthesizers and the wow. Synclavia and samplers and all the rest of it. And then all these individual keyboards that were on the sides. It was all on beautiful racks, all on big multi-cores. It used to take me 45 minutes to have my guys set up. Yeah. And gradually, you know, and I, I came from, you know, when I first started recording, it was all tape. But, you know, I came from analog synths and from programming and everything else. And I just worked out, you know, I've always, the, I, I own no synthesizers now. I got let's rid of do, them all. Let's do a little, a little tiny pseudo mini ITL. Right now, you've been using HDX for like six months, and you're using them with SSDs, and you're using. Um, describe your rig, and and I don't want to turn this into an avid commercial, but yeah. if it does, that's fine because this system now is a whole nother world. I mean, with with you've got 32 megs of RAM, mm. a gigs of RAM, and and so. It loads the session instantly. You don't wait on anything. Wow. And then the solid state drives are instant. So you can load a, a I've got some of these. Yeah, I mean, I, the, in my main system now, which is a. Uh, we've all been waiting for these new Mac Pros to come. Dear Lord, please come soon. <laughs> and, um, but I've got a Westmere at the moment, which is running uh, Lion, has 32 gigs of RAM, has four SSDs in there, plus. For solid state, solid state drives. drives, and these are all 512. Uh, best bargain in Amazon, by the way, is the Crucial M4 512, 600 bucks, which is about 50 percent less than most of the other SSDs out are you there. Business drive. Wow. Um, and so cool. uh, I've got a. There's a Trans International make this lovely caddy that you can get. Puts four of them on a. So you can slot them in and have the four drives in the like slots. Array. And then I've got another two drives inside where the optical thing. So I've got actually ten drives inside the system, mm. because I've got all my sound libraries. I mean, I've got terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of sound libraries. Mm. And is this the rig you're using currently for Spider-Man? I know yeah. you contractually I, you can't speak about certain things. Well, no, it's it's. I've got you know I, I have a second system I sometimes use on a, a, which is called a Vienna Pro uh, as a server, which are br just to stream sounds. But I found now with this rig I can run pretty well anything I want. Um, so I've got all my big string libraries, all the orchestral libraries, all the sort of contact stuff, all my big drum libraries, um, Omnisphere and, and the other plugins, all on these SSDs, which mean that you know, there might be a big string patch. There might be, a, say, a gigabyte of RAM, mm -hmm. a gigabyte of hard drive, you know, thing. On, on a normal fast hard drive, it might take me a minute, minute and a half to load. This loads five seconds. Amazing. It's really, really quick. Wow. And, 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 and Avid approves the, the SSDs? I don't know, but I'm running them perfectly fine, and I have been for a while. Are you running 7.2 Lion? I'm running 10.7.2, yeah. And I'm running, um, and I'm running four SSDs. I'm, I'm running a high-point RAID card, a 2721, 
okay. which does need a driver, guys, despite what they say. Okay. And um, uh, so I run the high point raid with four SSDs, then I'm running a, sorry, five SSDs, because the system driver is an SSD too. Golden rule, though, with SSDs and with anything is back up. Because SSDs, when they fail, and I've had them fail from other manufacturers before, they die. And there is on and there is off, and you lose everything. Mm. So but you shouldn't be using those for storage anyway. They should just be for speed. I, I mean. use them for all my libraries. I don't record to them so much. You don't need to worry with 10. We're recording into RAM anyway. And then I'm just using the disks. Um, uh, you know, I can now run a 120-track session on my laptop off a, off a USB stick because it just reloads it all into RAM. Herb, Herb loves laptops. Say that yeah. again. Give Herb a wood. <laughs> Well, you know, it really, I, I, I and, hate and to the, say the this, HDX but it is. Are, 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 you're running three cards? I'm just running one at the moment, but I'm going to get a second. But I, one gives me 256 tracks of audio. Yeah, and it's a whole new world, isn't it? It's also the thing is that all those, the amount of DSP that went into the mixer and all that stuff that you see, all those as they come in, that goes away because the HDX just has that there. Now there is a lack of plugins, you know. At the moment, it's well, on, on the on the X, but you, you yeah. still run Arte. I mean, uh, yeah, Arte's native, yeah, native is. What, is I mean, that's the thing is that it's an, effectively what I'm running is a native system, and, and Pro Tools native is a good sounding rig for guys who don't want to get an HDX card. I can yeah. highly recommend the native. Is running a native rig? And really, really good. Yeah. Um, well, man, uh, that, I, that's, that that was kind of a good substitute for ITL, and. Uh, I, I, now I got gear envy, Herb. <laughs> you should. I do, and I don't even have any gear. I mean, I mean yeah, but I've got ear envy. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I wish I could mix like Touché, you. Touche, sir. <laughs> so, so when I did that mix for you, and you told me it sounded good, should I have believed you? No, I have <laughs> no idea what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that was good too. I've been teasing him about yeah. this forever. <laughs> He's a good kid. Simon, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change subjects for a minute because Trevor Horn is one of my favorite people that's ever created a record. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you work with Trevor on Yes, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Um, his, his process, is, is, is he musical like us? Is oh, he's a he... great musician. I mean, a great bass player. Oh, I think that's the one, reason. you know, he was a bass player in The Buggles. I think people forget, you know. The Buggles was the first video that MTV played. It was called mm. Video Kill the Music Star. I always have a or problem. Music Kill the Video. Yeah. Video Kill video something. Video Kill the Radio Star. Radio Star, right. yeah. And, and I always, there is one issue, and I have it, and it's not to do with Trevor. It's to do with everybody after Trevor, which is that, for me, Trevor, in some ways, killed British record production for a long period of time because there is... Trevor is, you know, his ability was to be a great filter. So he'd have a team of guys and he'd say, no, that's good, that's good, and so on, and he'd come up with it. He was really, really good at that. But the problem was that, you know, he once said to me once about, you know, I'm not sure about a good song. I like having a bad song because I can do anything I want with it. <laughs> um, and... Uh, that's the story of my career. But, but the, uh, if you listen, if you look at, for instance, great British production, you know, before Trevor, you've got the Glyn Johns of this world who yeah. did things like The Who. You've got, obviously, the George Martin and all this, the stuff that, all the, there's tons of great producers during the 70s. And Trevor comes in, suddenly all record production changes fundamentally. He's my favorite from the 80s. Oh, I agree. Man, I'm telling Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I remember we can, remember, I was at college in Manchester um, when two tribes from Frankie Goes I worked on the second Frankie album a bit, which was mainly produced by Steve Lipson. But the... Um, Two Tribes came on, and the radio station just played it on cycle because so many people phoned up. It was an astounding thing to listen to. It was. It and these like great nothing. records like Propaganda, Dr. Also, Mabuza. too, um, yeah. Owner of a Lonely Heart. Oh. It's just oh my Trevor God. Rabin. Her, Ron Fair had the original demo of, of that, yeah. of, of uh, Tre Trevor oh. Rabin's demo of, of Owner of a Lonely Heart. And you got to hear what, what Trevor Horn contributed to that. It was pretty spectacular. I spent nine months on, a, on an album called Big Generator. Oh, which wow. was uh, which was there, record. and that was um, that was an interesting process. Um, they were they were a band who had a lot of interesting, strong characters, and that uh, you learn quickly that the politics is an important part of your life. Absolutely um, right. Yes. But yeah. the, 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 you know, Trevor's the problem was that once Trevor came, everybody felt that they had to show off in terms of producing, and it had to be about the producer, not about the record and the. Mm. 
artist. Mm. I felt that and I liked it. I still, yeah, but it I works still if like you, showing off. If, you, if you're Trevor and you have, you know, if you're Trevor, that's great. Right. But sometimes with a lot of, a lot of them, not everybody was Trevor. Right, right. And, right. and a lot of people yeah. got carried away with that and they yeah. forgot about the singer yeah. and the artist. Yeah. yeah. And I came here, and that was the weird thing is I remember coming here and suddenly it was only about the singer and the artist. Wow. You know, that's not the singer and the artist, the singer and the song. Uh, Sorry. Something that's, that's non related just between you and me. Jill, I heard, had like a. Uh, it was terrible. An appalling it, thing happened. It, uh, but is she okay now? No, no. Oh, it, it, unfortunately, sad. she had a, a, there was a terrible family accident. And um, Jill is Trevor's wife yeah. and kind of manager. And I met her and I met, I met Trevor. He would never remember me, but uh, man, all, 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 all the best. <laughs> I'm just looking up here at my camera. Mm -hmm. uh, seriously, Jill and Trevor, man, all the best to you. Just I just wanted to get that yeah. out of the way. Yeah. Education, like you had, a, you 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 you're classically trained. Well, I had a lot of classical music in my family background. We came from, um, you know, there was a lot of classical music from. But let's people. combine about ten questions into one. Yeah. If I want to get in to the film industry, yeah, and secondarily the 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 record industry, tie in education, will drive. How 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 do you get into like like? I, I've got a lot of friends who are very talented, yeah. and they go, "Yeah, I want to start scoring films." You know, everybody wants everybody to be. Everybody wants to score films, Ooh, but they can that. they? I mean, is that a realistic goal? And if so, how important is the 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 the, the, the classical training? Because a lot of film scoring. Well, I guess what's his name from Moingo Boingo? He's not classically trained. Danny Elfman. No. I think it depends. I mean, I did an electronics degree. I didn't do a music degree because I had to wait a year to do the music degree I wanted to do, and. I thought, you know, the BBC had 13 had told me you need a technical degree to be a producer. So I had decided to do that instead. And, and Andy Aubin in, in Brisbane is, is questioning whether he should move from Brisbane to Sydney to go to SAE to, to, to learn engineering. I told him, if you're engineering now, stay there and just work on records. How, how would you advise? Well, there's actually a really good, I have to say, there's a guy called Jeff McGahn who's a great engineer in Brisbane. Um, who, uh, if he doesn't, you know, that there are some great. Uh, I, I, Brisbane, believe it or not, I've worked in Brisbane. It's a very nice town. I've and kind of good, directed this yeah. interview all over the damn yeah. place. But basically, I think the thing about film music is really it. Everybody, I've worked with some great, great record guys who tried to write film scores, mm -hmm. and it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. They were not very good at it because. There's a difference between writing a tune and writing underscore. Mm -hmm. Underscore. Underscore is what we're hired to do in film music. Yeah. Okay. We're not right. We're not. The the, the James, uh, John Barry once told me. Dialogue, effects way down here is the music, mm -hmm. and I was working with him. I think the first thing I did with him, we did uh, something on the soundtrack for Dance of the Wolves, yeah. and he was saying you can't fight a thousand buffalo. Right. And there's this scene where the thousand <laughs> buffalo are coming. So it's just, you know, there, there's not, you know, there's not much you can do about that. So you know where the music is in importance, and it's your time to you've got to grab those moments that you can, but also understand that you're playing the emotion, and that you are um, you're not as important as the speak speech, and you're not as important as the sound effects, mm -hmm. and it's how the guys, the great guys, will drag you through emotionally through a film. Mm -hmm. and that's what scoring is about. It's not about mm -hmm. the notes how you, do you How do you get to that point where somebody trusts you for that? I think it's all, most of the guys these days are coming out of the USC and UCLA film schools and a lot of these sort of things where they're writing, they're doing the student films and they're doing the small B pictures and so on. And, and it's just like us in records when we started. Mm -hmm. You know, you get those small B movies, you get this, that, and the other, and you do that student film for nothing. Guys, you need a reel. You have to have a reel to Absolutely. start off with. And, and nobody will hire you unless somebody's hired you. I know so that's totally in that exactly. world, school, would you say, in, in that world, school would be a little more important than in the mixing world? It depends on the type of school. For instance, you have to go for I think film schools that have relationships with studios are really important, mm -hmm. um, or have relationships with with film boards. You know, like the mm -hmm. they'll be you know each country they'll Even have like BAFTA. Yeah, exactly. Like that. Absolutely. When they have relationships like that, that helps because then talented guys will always come through. But it is tough, and and 
uh, like you know, we talk about the outlier thing. Yeah. You know, you may be in the wrong place in the, uh, the right time. Right. And that's that's terrible. But you, yes, even moving to Sydney. Sometimes, if you don't get any work in Sydney, that's worse than getting work in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think if you go to Sydney and do nothing for two years and then go back. You're in a worse place than if you were doing work and getting, to my opinion. Yeah, I yeah. Well, these are just opinions. But yeah, I think that you, my you heart need goes to. goes out because, I mean, yeah. we never thought like that. Are we screwed up or something? We just. Well, I mean, I don't I know. Got I got on a plane to L.A. and then I just tried. I got in a car and drove to L.A. with no money. That's how yeah. stupid I am. Yeah, well, I, I stayed here for six months. I used to fly back uh, on coach class, uh, the, fly back to England to, to work to keep myself in LA uh, <laughs> and so I was Absolutely. earning money there Absolutely. then fly back and stay here hoping and everybody yeah. else Absolutely. and and eventually then the job started coming yeah. and then you know you, but you there is that tough point you have to make it yeah. through and you learn something during yeah. that time you learn a yeah. resilience did, did, did we cover the that okay I mean are you yeah that? no no absolutely I, I really want I really want to take advantage of Simon while while he's here because he he represents what so many people want to be in a way that 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 they don't know how to get to that point. And no, that's no I, sure I think and, that. and actually I think Simon can speak to that. The the one thing that we should be doing on this show, mm -hmm. um, our show is actually an example of what Simon's talking about. Who would have thought? Two guys in our position at our age would create an internet show that we, and part of that is living life and taking a chance and getting in places where you don't know, putting in your 10,000 hours and giving it a shot and then taking it seriously. Yeah. And I'm, as my contribution on the show, it's important to me that now because of technology, people have lots of ways to deal with the widgets and stuff, but they don't get this stuff. And well, you can be we're, we're you can be great proxy. at this and we're, not know the other we're stuff. We're a proxy for for the internships uh, mm -hmm. for, for the for the studio. Like you, you, there's no studios to go learn at <laughs> now, and we're kind of a substitute for that. Well, and, and we that take that and, and very seriously. I think know? also the other thing is that sometimes, if I look at where my career is now, yeah. I I would never have known. You know, I look at the the turns. Mm -hmm. We've all had those Absolutely. things that go oh, through life. Gosh. You like that. And you sit there, you know, I do a lot of stuff all over the shop. I do mm -hmm. classical music, you know, I've worked with South London grime rappers, I've worked, you know, obviously done sort of the, the pop records and stuff like that. At the moment, I'm just finishing an album for um, a guy who is like one of these, um, Matt Monroe, mm -hmm. big, huge voice, yep. um, but a 21st century version of that. I mean, a guy's astounding mm -hmm. singer, and it's nice to work with a great singer. Um, uh, called Julian Ovenden, and, and please buy his album in, in <laughs> months to come. But the, uh, uh, you know, so, I so, look. Say that again. That, that's yeah. important. To yeah. About the album, how they buy it. Well, the, the, it's the, the guys. I mean, he's he's. It's nice to work with great musicians. You know, the guy's a really good singer, mm -hmm. and and I think that if we look at. Um, Sometimes you want your your acts, you know, to, to you you hope they're gonna that they show some class and they're gonna be, you know, the, it's that thing when you're making a record that is ultimately with somebody who um, you want them to be better. My job as a producer is always to make somebody's hundred percent that much better. Whatever they think their hundred percent is, I have to find a way of making it better. And that's true of all the people, whether it's the players right. or the you know the engineers and, and anybody else through that you hope that you're going to challenge them and in and and support them and give them a way to make yes. whatever they think Absolutely better correct. do this for me i know it can't be done but tr just try give me a, give me a typical day in the life of a guy that does what you do but but cheap, maybe a typical week compressed into like well, a Well, at the moment, I'm working in three, uh, the, the joys of the internet. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. I'm I, talking about more, yeah. more like, like, I know you got a, a, yeah. a non-disclosure with, with uh, yeah. Spider-Man, but can you give me like, like a, I got, I, 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 I got this. Well, I can give you, I can give you a general, I'll okay. give you a general sense. I mean, we're just starting the opening section of that movie at the moment. Um, James Horner has played a beautiful, you know, he's, he's scoped out the whole way that, the, that he wants the queue to go. James is uh, you know, a class act. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in this case, what he's done is he's then given, you know, hopefully gives me some freedom to do 
the, I do the electronic side of the scores. My job is, the, inverted commas on those things, is electronic music arranger. So if it is an orchestra, mm -hmm. I tend to make the noises. So there'll be the hits or the programming and, and so on. Now, I've got to try and take what is a, a beautiful thematic way of working and then try and give this, in this case, something that is the electronic side of make it cool. Are you watching a screen? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So we have a big monitor, mm -hmm. and we've created a click track so that, that may hit the different points through the opening scene. This, you know. And so I've got to say, well, we were going to hit this, this, and this. I, I'll give you an example. Here's a good example, not with Spider-Man, with Avatar. Avatar has the main battle sequence is nine minutes long. Yeah. James likes working with big cues. A lot of film composers work with small sections. They'll do 30, 40 second bits and then put them together. James likes that writing. So that is a nine Huge minute, of nine minute l single piece of music. Wow. We, 320 bars long. How many tons? Was that about a ton and a half? <laughs> <laughs> and there are any number of tempo changes. Uh, there are probably 40 or 50 tempo changes across that nine minutes. There's 5-4, four, 4-4, four, 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 three, four, two, four. Lots of different meter changes mm. and atmospheres and everything else. And so we had a, a sketch out. Then I start creating my thing, which was all the rhythms and the programming on that. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, you hopefully, there's a collaboration where, you know, you go, well, what do you, you want to try this? And then James says, well, this is, we could do this and so on. And you building the, the atmosphere across this enormous queue, which was 50, I think I used um, 50 gigabytes of um, oh, just on that yeah. one cue. Just on the nine minutes. Yeah, in terms of my program, 310 wow. songs, 20 songs. Yeah, so 325 tracks. We then did that three times because James Cameron came back and said, challenged us to make it better. Yeah. Said, no, you know what, this isn't what I want. And with James Cameron, you know, you, you never get there. <laughs> so you go back and we rebuilt it from scratch. Another 320 bars of music from scratch different music. Well, I mean, we adjusted the things we oh, liked and so on, but it does need reprogramming yeah. because of the way we're working. Do it again. He mm -hmm. says, this isn't right either. Wow. Go and do it again. So we've done almost a thousand bars of music, 27 minutes. At, this is all 140 beats a minute or so. Wow. So this is right? Yeah. Huge things like this. We did more music in that one cue than most film scores have got in their entirety. Incredible. And that was because Cameron says, make it better. Right. I How many days you. was that nine minutes? Like, what time, when, when, what time of day do you start work? Well, I start, I mean, I should be, no. <laughs> the, uh, it's about, uh, usually start about 10 o'clock. We usually finish eight-ish, something like that, every day. And then... And how many days was that? Well, I was on Avatar the whole year, 2009. Oh, they, they called me, James Horner called me and said, come and have a look at this movie. And you go, yeah, okay. He said, well, and we know you don't do this anymore, but just come and have a look at it. And I came and looked, and there was this, showed me a couple of minutes, and you go, my God. And you know it's going to change yeah. the world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, he said, uh, how do you fancy doing a week? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the end of January 2009. So yeah, okay. And so we try. And, and it works. Obviously, there's a there was a, a working relationship and you get those things you, with anything it's how the push and pull happens and there was a uh the, the simpatico there that was working that we all felt that as the team that it was working and film scores is very much teamwork Absolutely. by the way it, it's not like anything it's you can't be one guy in a room there are crews of guys people. so then they said well how do you fancy doing to say the end of april or to be april and i talked to my wife and my son um, they went back in England. They went back in England for, for family reasons, and we um, we talked about it. They said, "Yeah, well, they, they said, well, we can come out at Easter." And so I worked through, and then they said, "Well, what about July?" And so we go, "Yeah, okay." We talked about it a bit more, and they were able to come out and you know be at the, we've got a house in LA, so we were there for. This, uh, I finished on November the twenty second. Unbelievable. And it was. Uh, I mean, we were working on the on the on the sound on the song. Yeah. Uh, for the, what do you call it? Theme song for the movie. You were you were still heavy in the middle of it. 
I, we, were, we were doing stuff, we were making changes up until the day before the final, final print master was made on the last reel. Wow. And is, is that unusual? Oh, unheard of. Wow. Let, me, um, let me pay attention to the clock real quickly. Drew, yeah. yep. we're, we're going to throw in corner office real quickly. Drew, why don't you tee up a couple of questions, because I know you've got a deadline, then we'll come back for Batter's oh, Box. Yeah, no, no. Hit it, uh, Drew. That's fascinating. Uh, 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 I know so. A few uh, records that you can recommend for studying, mixing-wise and arranging-wise, a uh, good high point for reference. That's a good question. That's a very like good that. question. Um, okay. Better Let's think about those things. I have to say that there are things I come as, like, you know, there's an un unknown thing that Glenn Campbell did. We did a version of He Ain't Heavy, which is an astounding vocal, an astounding arrangement, really? the old school mm. arrangement, which mm. is, I, I really have to say, I'll be digging. Um, I think that um, you listen to some of the Earth, Wind and Fire stuff. Yeah. David always, you, Fire Foster used to say that he learnt more from Maurice White and those guys. Mm. Than, Red Lawrence too. Yeah. That you listen to those amazing things. I was, I was uh, lucky enough to, to, to work with a couple of the musicians on that stuff, and mm -hmm. you listen to... The Do you remember the name of, the, of, of, of your favorite? I, I mean, I have to say that I think that, for me, I, I think um, September is a just and a ludicrously great track. Mm -hmm. After The Love Has Gone, obviously, Foster wrote with uh, Bill Champlin, and uh, I'm trying to think who else was on there. But I think that September is just one of those great grooves. Mm -hmm. Things that the, if you listen to that, in terms of arrangements, everything else, that that's a, a high water mark for me. It's a great stuff. There. Amazing stuff. Drew, one more cool. for you. Yep. Uh, you from wrong. Urban Jack, uh, how much freedom do you have when working on a project as big as Avatar? Are the producers and director constantly over your shoulder, or do, do you get to do your thing? We do our thing, and then we get. To present it to, you know, I mean, the, we get quite a lot of freedom. Of, of obviously, you know, you you're presenting things and showing the scope of things to the directors. And on any film, it depends on different directors. Are di you know, obviously, very different in the way that they approach things. But you ultimately, in film music, it tends to be that directors think that they can write scripts, they think that they can shoot films, and they think that they can edit and so on. Whereas music is still the black art that involves. Right notes, right, and and so on. So you get more freedom than a lot of the other people in the film business do. Um, I think that ultimately it's their film. Mm -hmm. If if um, Avatar is the way that it is, or Titanic is the there the way that it is because of James Cameron, it is entirely his vision. We are there to provide him with the music as he wants it to be in his film. Mm -hmm. And so in some cases, with, with people like James Cameron, you get no, there is a clarity that you get, which is that when it's right, it's right. But you do get the chance to challenge him. Mm. There's a thing when these wood sprites are falling in, this, uh, in the middle of the forest when yeah. Jake is first there. Yes. Um, I was able to do a thing where I took a load of voices and turned them backwards, and then you hear these voices dropping gently along with these sort mm -hmm. of little there's, and you, you can build these exquisite textures. I mean, one thing I love about film music over records is that you have a freedom that comes because you, you're not stuck to 4-4. Four, four. Right. You're not stuck to having to have the four on the floor, you know, the kick mm -hmm. and the snare and everything else. You can s just choose the textures on, on the way. And that's the challenge there. I mean, I, I took a view with Avatar that I wanted there to be, an, I looked at it and thought there had to be an organic element to the synthesis, uh, the, there are no synthesizers used, I was only using samples on that, mm -hmm. on that film. But I looked at things like the Gamelan from Bali, and, um, which seemed to be an appropriate way to look at the, way that the sound world. You, know, you obviously have to create a palette of colors for any film. You know, did Karate, uh, Karate Kid a couple of years ago, the different palette of colors entirely, the yeah. film Spider-Man, has a whole different thing. It's, you know, it's, uh, you know you, each film is in itself thing, but you are there. Uh, you do get freedom, because obviously they can't stop you from doing stuff, but if you go too free, they fire you. <laughs> well, Drew, thank you. Yeah, Drew. Well Drew, done. Drew. That'll allow you to get out and get, make your Larrabee yeah, obligation. Larrabee. You're going to tee up your arm. It's batter's box time. Can I ask one quick question? Very quickly, because we're running out of time. Um, 
in terms of the two worlds, like the, the world you just described, I don't think I, I, I couldn't do that. I, I just can't. I'm not constructed that way. Uh, do you feel more comfortable in one world or the other? Is there a world right now that, that the future seems like brighter? In other words, if, if, if your son was 18, would you guide him more towards the movies or would you guide him more towards the records? Actually, I think cause my son actually is, is a one he's 10 and he's a wonderful he's a better musician than me mm. and uh, I look at what he's doing now he's playing jazz you know he's learned, which is great for me I think he's rather than playing Bach mm. and Beethoven he's learning he, at the moment he's playing I wish I knew how it feels to be free the old uh, which is just a wonderful Fantastic. song to, to, and um, I think if I was there I would guide him I don't know because I think I would guide him towards um, I'll guide him towards um, records just because I think the film business is is a much much harder harder business to, to get into yep. than the record I think you, you evolve into films you also Absolutely. need to have experience Absolutely. but you I think you need to to have made all those mistakes on something that was a little cheaper yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. thanks for answering that Are you ready for batter's box yeah, yeah go on okay uh, 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 this is Batter's Box number 451. It needs no introduction. There you go. Lead vocals. Chandler, the um, the EMI plugin. I think that's. Oh, the, I like love that, that one. Background vocals. Oh, oh, we're talking about an EQ or a compressor. Compressor. Okay. And in TEQ, I, um, I, I st quite like E-Pure, I have to say. I think that's a really nice. It's an open sounding EQ. Flux. You know, the the Flux EQ is great. Yeah. I, the 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 old favorite, yeah, go on. Uh, acoustic guitar. I think that I would probably go with a little bit of the Abbey Road, uh, the Brilliance pack, the top end on that. Mm -hmm. And I do like... 12, uh, 14 or something? Yeah, the one, yeah. And I like, um, I also like the um, compression on... Um, uh, the old freight, the Sonox stuff, still do. I still dig yeah. it all these years now. I, I'm, I'm late to that party, but I like that stuff. Piano. Yeah. Piano. Uh, acoustic piano. Yeah. Um, I like the Waves uh, V4 EQ, if I ever EQ piano at all. I like oh. rolling the bottom end off it oh, okay. and then just a tiny bit on the top. Do you, do, it, do, you do, it, do anything different for a synth piano as opposed to an acoustic piano? Yeah. Uh, I tend to, with the, the synth piano, you, you, often you'll find that the, it depends on the track. If you're doing something with, you know, you're a little bit more RB. Uh, I like, I'll. The compression, I tend to still like things like L2 sometimes does a job oh, cool. in terms of putting it in your face. Not a lot of our listeners get to do live strings, so tell me what you would do with synth strings. With synth strings, the big key here is not one reverb, oh. is use more than one reverb. I find that using a combination of a hall and maybe a plate or something, or a hall and a cathedral, but two different things, and also the early reflections are really important. Um, right. Much more than you think, and sometimes you find, because that slap off the walls. You know, I'm lucky, I get to work at Air and at Abbey Road and at, mm -hmm. and Fox and, and uh, Sony Studios here. That slap's important. Mm -hmm. uh, synth bass. Synth bass, well, the, the R bass is still, a, is still an old friend, I have to say. Um, do, you, do you, 80, 80 cycles is where you come from? Yeah, a little bit of that, and I think also the, um, but it's that old 165, the DBX 165 type thing, which, uh, uh, which the hardware used to do so well. Yeah, and I think that's nice. Yeah. Um, this is hard, to s but I'm going to toss it at you anyway. Electric guitars, that's kind of a broad. Yeah, um, I quite like Jack Puig's stuff. Uh, I've, been having, I've been digging his things uh, on the Waves pack. They're, they're really good. Yeah, Jack's got a new hardware version of a Pultec guy yeah. now. It's pretty cool. Uh, kick drums. Kick drums. Well, you scoop out that 400 hertz, don't you? Yeah. Um, and uh, I find that I'm trying to think of the best compressors for the kick drum. It's um, uh, the ones that I grab straight off. Um, I think it's, I find that if I over compress it, you know, you end up with uh, it, it being less than, yeah. than, than, than you know, it's always tough to find that thing. I used to layer all my kick drums and then use the sound as the compression as much as anything. I'll take a mm -hmm. lot of samples and then just make them so that you end up with a little bit from this and that. Is it the same approach for snares too? Yeah, the, the snares. I mean, the uh, I like the um, I like the Waves HEQ and I like quite oh, I like, do too. That's a really nice EQ. 
Yeah. I like both. In fact, if I had to have my Desert Island EQ at the moment would be the HEQ. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, I'm okay. sure I'm, I'm missing something the, in terms of, uh, I'm missing somebody. I should be saying something great Ooh, about no, one of the compressors no, no, no. out there, but there's well, some really good stuff yeah, out there. There's the, you're, you're a plug-in fanatic, so I know you've mm. got thousands. Um, in terms of live drums, what would, what would your go-to be for a room, say? For the room, um, if I'm, I tend to, f to find, the, you know, you want that sort of old distressor type thing sometimes mm -hmm. and to get that sound of there. Mm -hmm. um, I do like that that Chandler, the Abbey Road Chandler uh, compressor is really good mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. But when you put on the limiter section, the setting, uh, it's also very nice actually on terms of piano, for synth piano, it just has a bit of grit about it and it's quite nice to have the, just a little bit of something that has some extra oomph. What's, what's the sound toys that's the, that's the... Oh yeah. Now my life in film is different. Yeah. Echo Boy, Crystallizer, yeah. they, I live for those, um, and Filter. Decapitator. Yeah, Decapitator and Filter. Yeah. Um, I am... Heat. Heat is, if, yeah. if there's any one, if the magic plug-in at the moment, if yeah. you guys can save up your 495 bucks or whatever it is. Yeah, Dave Hill's a, he's one of my heroes. I yeah. met him at NAMM this yeah. year. So yeah, oh, like wonderful. Me. Heat is astounding. Uh, stereo bus. Stereo bus um, tend to use, uh, the Sonox limiter tends to be the one, the more, it depends on what I'm doing. If we're doing the sort of more open acoustic stuff, if I've got, you know, everybody playing, I will tend to use the Sonox, it's a bit more transparent. Do you use the enhance button? We've just, interesting, we're just listening to reference mixes. It does put a little distortion on there. I like it though. Yeah, and for, for, for pop, that's a good thing. Yeah. And I think that's, I like the enhance a lot. Mm. Uh, if, you're, if you've got something that has a bit more purist, you know, this rhythm section I've done, which has got, you know, Vinnie and Tim and all those guys on there, and we found that when we were doing that with the orchestra and everything else, when there's a lot of density in the mix, then the enhanced thing can sometimes overcook the pudding, mm -hmm. and you have to be careful. I think it works much better if you've got a slightly more open, say, like a more an urban track or something like that, where there's a bit more space, then the enhanced thing works very well. You know, I want to try to help you with an, a problem that you don't know that you have coming but when you get home and you take your machine and I'm on there and Dave is on there and Will's on there saying will you come back <laughs> we're just warning you now because we've only scratched the surface yeah, yeah. man Maybe thank you so much like a, a laser beam focus on the movie part of it because I, I find this so fascinating mm -hmm. and so anathema to everything I do in in the record world I, I, it's well the scary thing is we're still working yeah. <laughs> Somebody is paying. Well, we us never just work a day in our lives. We're still doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hope, hope you had a good time. Yeah, we had. It was a great time. It was Simon, very, man, very, thank very you. nice. This was incredible. Here. Great, absolutely okay. incredible. Dave, take us home. Clock is running. Man, um, there's nothing else to say other than uh, I can't wait to have Simon back and every guest we've ever had. I can't wait to have back. But uh, uh, there's a lot of information here. Hopefully, we got some of the philosophical questions answered for you because. Our heart goes out to, to you guys that are making decisions. Herb and I agonize over these answers, and I hope we got a little bit of that. Let me Can also, I didn't mean to cut you off, but let yeah. me also just really quickly, congratulations again. Remember to enter, oh, yeah. uh, enter at pensadosplace.tv slash forward slash avid. Uh, congratulations to Mauricio Sousa Clay from Portugal. Thank you, avid. There's how you enter. Um, Coming at you with lots of good stuff uh, this year, and uh, Simon certainly represents that. We got we got uh, some more neat people coming up for you. Uh, a, a lot of the guys that we have are, are busy working, so I can't always give you a heads up. But uh, we got some great guests coming up, and uh, hope everybody has a good week, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>